Robin and and um, and go ahead. Hi, hello, yeah, to everyone. My name is Robin Jackson. I'm with the Navajo Environmental Justice Organization, Dinner Care. Um, I also have a cold, so I'm not quite up to par, but um, I'll share what I can. And as Jim said, I've got a time restraint just because there's uh, some stuff going on here. So I can only be on for a little bit, but I wanted to make sure to be on today. Uh, I appreciated Jim and Tom with 350 giving us this opportunity to just be here with you to talk a little bit about why we support the merger. Um, so Dine Care, along with some other organizations, including Tuanajana Ene, TNA, San Juan Citizens Alliance, um, and then the NAVA, uh, they've recently changed their name. And if Joseph Zahn, he can speak to the Native American Voter um, Education Project. So uh, many of our organizations were Navajo Nation based, Four Corners based organizations. And we, uh, over the last few years, have been involved in a number of PR, New Mexico PRC cases. And so now um, one of the cases has gone before the New Mexico Supreme Court, where we intervened um, and we intervened in it prior in the merger discussion in the merger case because we wanted to bring forward the issues that we've been working on in our area of the state, um, the Four Corners area. So I guess if I could just talk about the area we're in, the region we're in, um, the Four Corners is pretty different and unique, um, very different infrastructure, very different history, and there's a long history of a lot of resource extraction that's happened in the area, um, a lot of oil and gas <clears throat> industry, and a lot of um, coal strip mining that's taken place, uh, two power plants who've been there for decades, the Four Corners Power Plant, the San Juan Generating Station, and although there has been some revenue and some jobs provided in the region at the same time, it's come with a heavy toll of um, a lot of health impacts in the area, um, including on tribal lands, on Navajo Nation lands. So we've been involved in trying to bring attention to those issues. Uh, we care about public health. We care about um, indigenous people's rights. Uh, we have a long history of being here as Diné people. Um, so in addition to oil and gas and coal, there's also been a past history of uranium mining that's happened. Um, so the area has been heavily hit for a long time. And it, those industries, oil and gas, coal, they're a boom and bust economy. And now with the coal plants closing um, in a number of places, and for instance, with Diné Care, we were involved with um, a lot of environmental justice work on the Navajo Nation for 30 years now. And we've seen, um, we've seen when a coal plant closes and there isn't anything to replace it. So for instance, the Navajo generating station out in Page, Arizona, uh, it got coal from the Kayanta mine, Black Mesa mine, and there really wasn't anything in place to help with transitioning that area for the workers or even for the Navajo Nation who had um, had a, a major part of their revenue in the um, coal industry. So part of the reason why we um, got involved in being interveners in these PRC cases and in the merger um, between PNM and Avangrid was because we wanted to bring up just transition. We wanted that to be something that was discussed so that there was some type of um, provisions, some type of uh, understanding that these are the real issues that people are dealing with in the, in the coal impacted communities and in the Four Corners area, um, along with all of the health impacts um, long environmental justice issues that have been in the area. Um, I think that, well, I feel like when I go to Santa Fe or Albuquerque, it's, you know, it's a pretty far distance and it's hard to remember the impact of 
what coal strip mining does, what um, thousands of oil and gas wells, um, what that's like when you're living near that, if you're having to smell that, if you're having to hear that, uh, there's a lot of pollution from these different um, facilities in that industry. So, um, in, as I said, we those are the main reasons we decided to be interveners. And PNM and Avangrid, they are big utilities, and they've been in the area for a long time. So, I mean, it's not that we have a great love for them or want to be their great advocates. It's just that we recognize they've been in here and Avang Avangrid has, um, has helped secure renewable energy projects in different regions of the world. And so we also see there's an opportunity there that they could help establish that. And so in um, the merger case we were involved in with the PRC, um, our groups, the Four Corners groups, we pushed for certain provisions in a stipulated agreement that included 200 megawatts of renewable energy, that that be something we, um, that I've been asking Avangrid to agree to. Uh, additionally, 12.5 million for just transition funding to support Four Corners coal impacted communities. Um, so that would be over a five year period, but that is something that could help the communities in the region. There are local organizations there, local um, chapters who could put that or make use of those funds for some type of transition project to diversify their economy, to develop something, some type of resiliency project. And one of the things that we've heard in talking with a lot of people in the area, um, but also just our working with community there is that area in addition to having um, endured a lot of oil and gas and coal um, extraction and that form of economy, it's also a place where there has been a lot of um, food development. So there's a lot of uh, farming that goes on there. So that's one area that could be supported more. Um, I know this because although I'm a Diné person who grew up more in the middle part of the Navajo reservation um, on the Arizona side, but where I live, we're just like four miles from the New Mexico border. Um, although that's where I primarily grew up, my father's side was from the Hogback Ship Rock area. And so I do know that there's this great reliance on the San Juan River for a lot of agriculture use. People still grow their traditional corn, they still grow melons and squash. That's still a really important part of Navajo culture and um, a form of income for some of the local farmers there. Um, and then also, just there's a lot of younger people who want to support food security, food sovereignty, and um, that's something we want to support that's there, um, that could be, um, further developed. So I just wanted to express that's part of why we've been involved, um, as people from out in this area. And we see that there's some really good opportunities that could be supported. And that's why we were involved in, um, being interveners in these different cases and why we continue to also have involvement at the Supreme Court level. Thank you. Uh, Robin, would you just um, help us understand what a stipulated agreement is, what that means? I don't think I could exactly go into all of that, but there has been discussion between the different interveners and um, that had been something our attorneys had secured for us between um, Av and Grid. Um, if Mike wants to jump in and say anything a little bit more about that, but. Okay, so this, so basically this is an agreement that uh, your attorneys have worked out with these big utility companies for for funding. That, uh, just I just wanted to see the, the big picture. Uh, right now, we can get into the details, but 
Yeah, I we've heard in the way that we do describe it, they're legally binding um, provisions that um, Avangrid is willing to comply with. And also that 12.5 million for just transition funding, it's um, gonna be used and dedicated towards Four Corners community. So it's not at all our intervener groups. I want to also stress that it's for the Four Corners communities. Right. Uh, thank you. Um, who would like to go? Who would like to go next? Nicole, are you on? Yeah, I'm on. Um... Would you want to introduce yourself so, and, and, and then and then talk a little bit? That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. So um, thanks, Robin, for notifying me uh, about this call. I um, have been really busy with um, Corporation Commission meetings in, on the Arizona side here last week. Um, my name is Nicole Horsherder, and I'm the director of Twin Zona Ennis an organization that is based on Black Mesa, on um, Napo Nation. Um, and uh, just a little bit about Black Mesa, maybe everybody already knows, but uh, we were once host to two uh, coal mines, both operated by Peabody Western Coal Company. Um, the Black Mesa mine, um, Supplied coal to Mojave generating station while the camp mine supplies coal to the Navajo generating station, now closed Navajo generating station. Um, so, the things that we have learned from um, fighting for coal plant closures, um, and not necessarily actually, actually, that's not really um, not quite accurate. We've always we, we started out as water protectors, we wanted to fight industry to get off our water, our only source of drinking water. That's how we began. This led us into compliance issues, pollution issues, other issues with both the coal mines and the coal fire power plant. So now that they're closed, we're trying to use, we'd like to use our experience and our um, whatever, um, knowledge that we have gained from um, fighting the industry to help transition the entire Navajo Nation, because we'd like to see the entire Navajo Nation uh, transition to uh, renewable energy. And the main reason why we're so concerned about that um, is that we have a water issue on the Navajo Nation. I mean, in general, we have a water issue in the Southwest, but on the Navajo Nation, the state of New Mexico is not our friend. The state of Arizona is not our friend. And um, more and more, we're finding out that the federal government who has a trust responsibility is, is not really out there to, to look out for us either. So, we have to figure out a way to move forward to get the basic needs that that our communities need: um, water, uh, infrastructure, power, and we need to do it in a way that's going to help protect the drinking, especially the drinking water that we have left. And we have to figure out ways to manage the resources that we have left on the Navajo Nation. Um, all this funding that's come out just recently is just going to go so far. COVID, just a perfect example of how what happens to communities when they don't have basic, basic infrastructure. Um, and the Navajo Nation was a, a great example of, of, of that, of what it's like to not have infrastructure and, and deal with, with a pandemic. Um, so, the things that we're concerned about in this merger, I would say, is we want to see a commitment from the company to replace their 
you know, transmission lines with renewable energy. And we, we realize renewable energy is not the silver bullet, it, but it's the best thing that we, we can do for ourselves right now. Um, we, this, is, this is really important is that we would like to support a company that can show, can provide that kind of commitment that they're going to divest 100% in coal. And, and when we say divest 100%, that does not mean transfer it to somebody else. That means divest and close and that coal is gone. And when we say we want to see them invest in renewable energy, replace all that with renewable energy, we don't want to see any other types of green energy that, you know, quote, green energy out there that, that have been floating around. We want to see something whether it's just solar or wind. Um, anything, any kind of replacement that's going to use up any more water is not acceptable. I, I, I realize that maybe solar, some solar might use little bits of water, but I mean, anything like hydrogen, and we've heard a lot of talk about green hydrogen and we keep telling people uh, in our nation that no, you're not gonna do green hydrogen because the, the projects that are being proposed out there are not green hydrogen. Um, and so we know that that's not gonna happen, but I think we know that they're using this type of language because they want support. Um, so that's, that's not acceptable. So that's, that's where we stand. And, and so the continued dialogue, we will be in, and even though we don't have these assurances 100%, this is what we hope to continue to push for as long as we have. And so that's why we're trying to keep, you know, the dialogue open between us and the company and the, the PRC and anyone else that's involved is that this is going to be the goal. Otherwise, we back out um, and then we don't get a chance to talk. Or we take a, a position in which is so adversarial that nobody wants to talk to us. And even though we're in, in the procedures, in the, in the processes that are in place. Um, so this is where we're at, I think, and I hope that I didn't step out of line by, by saying that. And if I'm not correct, maybe one of the other groups, because we are a, a coalition, a group of um, four groups. And so I don't want to speak on behalf of the others, but I believe this to be our common goal. Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, I, I, I think that was very clear. Um, and uh, I see that, um, and, and hopefully we'll have uh, some time to uh, have a little more discussion once we have the, the rest of the presenters um, uh, talk a little bit and then we can have uh, kind of amplify and, and uh, some of these important points. And Jim uh, Joseph Fernandez has joined us. Yeah, I see that. Joseph. Uh, welcome. Um, uh, Joseph. Welcome. Yes, yes. I'm trying to, it's saying I'm not able to start my video. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> yes, you cannot. That's all right. Okay, <laughs> try, try it again, Joseph. Okay. I, I think I just fixed it for you. There it there is. is. There you go. Uh, so Joseph, um, Robin and Nicole have 
kind of outlined uh, where they're coming from a little bit. And I don't know if you had a chance to hear that. Uh, so we're, maybe you can help us understand uh, why, uh, well, first of all, um, Robin said that your organization has changed its name. So we need to get you to introduce yourself and then talk a little bit about uh, why you're involved in the stipulation agreement, what that means to your organization and you. Thank you. Yes. And, um, and I appreciate uh, this opportunity. And, and I see a lot of familiar faces and, and names. I'm glad to, to be on this evening. Again, my, my name is, uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Joseph Hernandez, and I am the Danette Energy Organizer for NAVA. Uh, formerly, uh, our, our organization was known as uh, uh, NAVA Education Project or uh, NAVA EP, but uh, we have uh, rebranded and uh, our um, organization is, uh, is now, and, and I'll, I'll put it in the uh, chat box, and it's just uh, Neva <laughs> uh, to to uh, for just to help everybody, um, and I I am also uh, I I uh, have been working on the energy side of of um, since uh, I actually got started working uh, for the organization. Um, my first day or first when when I got hired on. I started working uh, in July of 2019, the same month that the Energy Transition Act was signed into law by the governor. And so that was my first task, you know, was to um, take the information from the law and we were doing community engagement, community outreach. Um, I, I only work with, uh, on the New Mexico side uh, of the Navajo Nation, there's uh, 56 Navajo uh, chapters. Those are all are known as local governments. Um, and so um, that's the, 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 the work that I, I, I've, I've been doing since July of 2019 is working on, on energy uh, policy, energy issues, and advocating for a, uh, a just and equitable transition. And so uh, we, um, again, we, we were, uh, um, we were um, uh, monitoring the, de the development of, 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 the, of, of the case. And when uh, Danette Kerr and Tod Najoni Ani, as well as San Juan Citizens Alliance um, had, had reached out to uh, our organization, um, uh, and again, because of the work that we are doing here on the ground in the community of, uh, from the Energy Transition Act, uh, you know, we um, had, had felt that, you know, uh, we, we had to uh, ensure that, number one, that there was, um, you know, a strong tribal um language to for communities you know that there was community benefits that were coming to to the impacted communities here that have uh, suffered the, the most from from resource e extraction and, and again uh these uh the the communities in in this region time over time ha have sacrificed a lot, you know, and um, just before COVID, uh, we were dealing with the, I think it was back in 2015, the impacts from the Gold King mine spill, you know, so it was a uh, just, you know, one, one, um, you know, um, the, the, the community, you know, is, is still to this day suffering a lot, you know? And the, um, the discussions and, and the, uh, um, what, the, the solutions we felt weren't uh, gonna be beneficial un until 
we were able to like uh, um, partner up and, and work with uh, the other organizations that are here, uh, you know, and, and that's why we, we intervened to ensure that, the, that we can secure um, the, the roadmap for a clean energy economy for the Four Corners region. And, and uh, using a lot of the, um, the uh, key partners, the key stakeholders that we have already uh, built a relationship with, um, because you, you, you can't just come up in here and just promise. You have to, you know, like uh, have that strong relationship. With, with community leaders. And, and so it was um, from that angle, um, you know, that, that's why we, we went ahead and, and, and um, moved forward on, on, this, on this case and, and, and with that perspective, uh, because again, you have like institutions like Navajo Technical University in Crown Point, uh, you know, that does, doesn't get a lot of attention. And, and they have a renewable energy program called the Energy Systems uh, Program, which uh, teaches students about photovoltaic and wind energy systems. In fact, students can't, can't graduate because by the time they get enough knowledge, they're already um, getting job offers. <laughs> and, and so the, the instructor has a hard time keeping students uh, throughout the whole two year program because they're, they're getting job offers in their first year. And the thing is that they, um, they were in a uh, trailer when I first, when, when I first uh, uh, started working with them back in 2019, they got moved into a much smaller trailer, a much smaller trailer. Um, and so they need a, a, a building, you know, they need a training center because they're teach the, the, the new class of students that just came in are all women, Navajo women, uh, uh, you know, class. And so it's, it, it's pretty amazing seeing, hearing their stories, you know, and when we talk about energy justice, when we talk about, you know, uh, really making an impact in, in, in these uh, communities, you know, it's really investing and putting money into uh, programs like that, you know, I'll stop there. I, I think I went through a lot, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. And I really appreciate this opportunity to talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, and I hope, uh, hope you have a little bit of time to stick with us as well as uh, uh, Robin said, she's gonna have to uh, uh, leave uh, fairly soon, but uh, hopefully Nicole and uh, Joseph will stick around. Um, and I, I wanna at this point uh, introduce uh, Mike uh, Eisenfeld. Uh, and Mike, uh, would you tell us a little bit about uh, San Juan Citizens Alliance and, and uh, how you've gotten involved in all this. Yeah, good evening. Um, my name is Mike Eisenfeld. Um, I live in Farmington. I lived here for the past 26 years. Um, what brought us here was my wife is executive director of a child advocacy center. Um, and uh, so basically um, I've worked for San Juan Citizens Alliance as our energy and climate program manager since uh, 2006. And um, from 2006 to now, the past 16 years, um, we've seen a real changing landscape. I just wanted to uh, share a screen um, so you all can kind of see some of the things that um, Nicole was talking about. Can you see the map um, of the Four Corners area? Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, circa 2010. And um, so, we have the San Juan Generating Station. It's a San Juan power plant. It's what it's named in this map in the Four Corners Power Plant. San Juan Generating Station um, built in 1972, Four Corners Power Plant built in 1962. At one point, um, the largest single pollution source 
in the United States. Um, as you can see, San Juan Generating Station is on um, state and, and federal land. Four Corners Power Plant is on um, Navajo Nation. Desert Rock Power Plant was proposed um, just below the Four Corners Power Plant. The idea behind that power plant was the pollution was so bad um, already that you wouldn't notice a third and very devious proposal by Blackstone, Bracewell, Giuliani, and Scythe Global to build um, the Desert Rock Power Plant on tribal land when they knew they couldn't do it anywhere else. Um, that was really when I got kind of very involved, um, 2006 to 2011 on the Desert Rock Power Plant. That was the main thing that I worked on. Um, um, that was sort of where I got to know uh, Nicole and Robin. Um, you know, just uh, amazing um, advocates, amazing um, organizations, but even more so amazing people, you know, the, the things that they articulate, the things that um, they see, the things they do. Um, so we're Farmington, a, you know, border town. Um, it's all energy export. We also had the proposed Mustang generating station. We had a uh, cottonwood um, coal plant. Um, what Nicole was referring to, kind of mine in Black Mesa mine, where they slurried the coal down to Mojave and then um, Navajo Generating Station. So <clears throat> the thing that sort of was pushing um, a lot of these coal plants um, to clean up um, during that 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 time frame 2011 or so was the uh, regional haze program of the clean air act um you'll see on this on this map the checkered um green areas as a class one air shed that's a key for a clean air act a regional haze program but you also see that um some of the sites it should be class one like chaco culture national historical park canyon de Shea national monument they're not on there. They've not been afforded the same protection, probably because they're on tribal land. So anyway, um, we sort of spent that era of 2006 to 2011 defeating Desert Rock, which was a huge victory for this region. Um, that sort of led to scrutiny of the Four Corners Power Plant and San Juan Generating Station where units were closed at both of, of those facilities. And uh, we were told um, it's a done deal. Don't worry about it. Ben Ray Wuhan said, told me, you know, gave me a pat on the back and said, you closed half of San Juan Generating Station. Um, that's good enough. You know, don't worry about it. It's gonna be in operation until 2053. Well, about 2018, we started getting, um, 2017, 2018, uh, conditions changed for the utilities and they started talking about retiring coal plants earlier. And um, they put a bill together in a 2018 legislative session. Um, that was the first Energy Transition Act bill. It didn't make it through, but at that point, um, PNM sort of let it be known that they wanted to utilize a tool called securitization um, to basically um, use the Energy Transition Act to um, possibly move to um, cleaner ways of um, creating electricity. And then they told us up here in Farmington, they came to Farmington and had what's known as a whistle stop tour and they wanted to know from the community if there was any objection to them closing San Juan Jenner Station a little earlier, rather in 2053 to 2022. So a 31 year difference. And so one of the things that my organization, San Juan Citizens Alliance is adamant about is that there has to be a transition planning and there has to be transitions for the workers. There has to be um, consideration of the school districts and there has to be a replacement of property taxes, and also that we need to be part of innovative technologies for things like renewable energy, that if we're gonna close down the coal plants, that we need to create economic opportunities for this region. And so major premise for us then became the Energy Transition Act of 2019, 
where we were advocating for 100% renewable energy replacement. Um, the next thing that sort of like we became aware of is that it's like we need to be careful because we're not um, ratepayers of PNM. In Farmington, we're part of a municipal utility and we have our own struggles with the Farmington electric utility system and some of their regressive policies. They're a 5% owner in the San Juan generating station. So, you know, we uh, are on them about that. But um, that was a really important tenant for us was to kind of go, look, we're not, we're not a rate payer in Albuquerque or, or, or Santa Fe. Our, our issues are a little different. Um, you know, focus on what's happening um, in the impacted community. So then, um, as, as sort of like, as most things, this has been sort of a, a progression, but the first thing that happened was that um, PNM filed for abandonment of San Juan Generating Station before the Public Regulation Commission. And we're pretty fortunate um, because of the relationship with the organizations up here in, in, in the Northwest part of the state that we were able to acquire legal representation from Western Environmental Law Center at a Taos and that um, they're willing to represent us in intervening um, in that abandonment case. And so as interveners, um, several of us gave testimony and that testimony included that, um, what I said before, that there had to be replacement resources here, that there had to be um, holding um, PNM responsible for historic liabilities um, an assignment of liabilities that they needed to um, retire San Juan Generating Station. They needed to demolish it. They needed to do decommissioning um, and they needed to work with the former owners. There's nine current or former owners. So um, because there are federal nexuses and permitting, um, there's bonding there. And, you know, so it's not just PNM, um, but, you know, basically we needed to hold them accountable. And so that was sort of a, you know, a, a thing with us. And we do have some relationships with PNM people, right? But I think as, as Joseph said, um, you know, it's us turning up at every meeting and kind of like sitting, if, you know, even if we, even if we weren't kind of, you know, the, the main people commenting, we're, they knew we were there. And, um, you know, Going to a meeting in Farmington, New Mexico can be interesting because it can be like 300 coal miners um, in their um, equipment and their families. And, you know, we need to be um, thoughtful of what happens to them sort of in this transition. So the abandonment then of San Juan Generating Station was then sort of complicated by the announcement in, in October of 2020 that um, PNM planned to merge with Avent Grid. And so we started doing some um, research and investigation, you know, who is Avant Grid? Evidently, um, they're an offshoot of Iberdrola in Spain and, you know, portray themselves uh, as um, a conduit for um, clean energy opportunities, renewable energy. Um, that was then sort of um, kind of convoluted by some of the information com coming out of um, where they are in the United States, some stuff out of Maine that was a bit concerning. Um, so anyway, um, the same four groups that, the, the four groups on this call, uh, TNA, Diné Care, and, uh, and NAVE AEP, um, we intervened um, in the merger case because we felt like we needed to sort of like make sure that we were in a mix that if we're not part of the dialogue, then we're not gonna get the stipulations um, that we um, need and deserve. And the thing that had also happened that was sort of cool was in the abandonment of San Juan Generating Station, we secured 100% renewable energy replacement in the form of solar um, up here. And uh, there were a lot of people who were telling us that'll never happen. You know, y'all should get on board with natural gas. and. We have a lot of issues with natural gas. We have a lot of issues with, with coal. We like, um, I think that Robin referred to us, but you know, basically in the 1970s, we were deemed an energy um, sacrifice zone 
the National Sacrifice Zone in uh, President Nixon's Project Independence. Um, we are a culture of abandonment. The utilities and uh, coal companies leave. Um, we've seen that happen time and time again with like Southern California, Edison at Four Corners Power Plant, BHB Bellaton, the mine owners um, for the mines that serve San Juan Generating Station, Four Corners Power Plant. So we're like, we got to hold, you know, folks accountable on their way out the door. So, you know, if PNM's going out the door, um, they, they need to be held responsible for some of the liabilities, but they also need to be held responsible for some of the talk that they got going where they're like, oh, we're renewable energy people. And, you know, we're going to, you know, how do you balance that out with 50 years of burning coal that have had just a enormously um, detrimental impact on this region? So anyway, in the Avant Grid stuff, we decided that we were better off sort of like, like, I think we're skeptics about utilities. We, we feel like we're an energy export area and we're gonna get taken advantage of and we're just, we're done with that. So we didn't really care if it's Avant Grid or PNM or Arizona Public Service Company or Tucson Electric Power. We needed to sort of get in the dialogue, be part of the mix. And that I think was an important decision for us to be intervening in not only cases in New Mexico, but cases, rate cases in Arizona, where this concept of just transition is starting to, to sort of creep in um, to, the, to the discussion. And so um, this merger, the, one of the key parts of it is that it's supposed to be in the public interest. And I think that there were concerns about Avant Grid and, and there have been concerns about the way that PNM is behaving. And I think that people were really um, pretty much shocked that um, the merger was not approved um, by the PRC. But um, we decided that um, to invite Avangrid to come up here and take a look at some of the facilities, the coal facilities that they're inheriting. Because you know, when they're doing these acquisitions, it all sounds good you know, on paper. Um, like I'm, I'm looking at their environmental, social, and um, corporate govern governance policies. And, you know, you read these things and, and, and you know, they, it's like they're, you know, the best people in the world, you know, and these utilities have created a huge problem up here. The climate change impacts are profound. Um, we have all this water that comes through Farmington. We've got 66% of the surface water in New Mexico flows through Farmington and we squander most of it on these coal plants. And we need to sort of reassign, you know, where our water goes to, renewable energy to farming. And so all this stuff, the merger, the Energy Transition Act, um, Joseph is a convener on the Energy Transition Act, and we're trying to make sure that the money goes to uh, the proper people. But one of the problems with the Energy Transition Act and the merger is these things have sort of gotten dragged out in the PRC process and now before the Supreme Court. Um, the community um, has not you know, benefited from um, this transition. And the community, instead of sort of embracing that transition is, um, is our, our, legislat our legislators and the city of Farmington are pursuing um, a clean coal project, carbon capture, carbon sequestration, which has, hasn't gotten off the ground. They're also talking about, you know, nuclear, they're talking about blue hydrogen, um, I, I think it's all a bunch of snake oil and I think it's all very speculative and I think it's kind of unfortunate, but that's the sort of stuff that, um, that the community eats up because for the past 50 years, we've had these two, two large coal plants and so, and the coal mines, but a lot of these jobs have gone away. So at the coal mine right now, San Juan mine that provides coal to San Juan generating station, there's 105 workers and there's 150 workers at San Juan Generating Station. So if you took 255 salaries of $80,000 a year, um, you know, that, that's the sort of thing that energy transition, we should be funding those folks for severance, for job retraining, but, but this whole idea that, you know, we have to save all these jobs and save the coal industry, it's going away because economics, that's a deal. Like the renewable energy that was secured by, uh, in the PRC case, the abandonment of San Juan generating station is one third of the cost of coal derived electricity. 
And um, another thing that our groups work on is permitting those, um, those solar facilities because some of them are on federal land and they require um, environmental assessments and or environmental impact statements. So behind the scenes, those are the other things that we're working on. Um, so anyway, um, Avangrid hasn't come for their site visit. We're not happy about that. We keep inviting them. Um, but they're too busy with like Earth Day events and stuff in, in, in Santa Fe and, and you know, um, but um, I think that uh, if we can pull off this transition to renewable energy up here, whether it's, you know, Avangrid or PNM, whoever it is, the, the most important thing is retirement of San Juan Generating Station, full retirement in September of 2022. It's really important that we don't get hoodwinked on that, you know, with utilities claiming that there's going to be blackouts in some far off city. I mean, that's, that's our deal. I mean, I literally have had people tell me, you know, Four Corners Power Plant needs to keep running because people need air conditioning in, in, in Phoenix and in Tucson. And, you know, it's just an unbelievable social justice, environmental justice deal up here. Um, and I just want to convey my thanks to Joseph and, and, and Robin and Nicole uh, for working with me like all these years. But I, I couldn't have done it without the support of like Tom and Jim at 350.org and Sydney, Sydney Beatles at Western Resource Advocates who's on the call. Um, it, it's definitely a David versus Goliath thing. You're dealing with these utilities that are thrown, like the Avant Grid attorneys were making, I think like $600 an hour um, and then the PNM executives are trying to get golden parachutes of several million dollars. So those are the people we're on calls with. And it's like, you know, I can assure you, I'll never have a golden parachute. I can assure you that I'll never like turn up working for a coal company. Um, I want to see the right thing done for the Four Corners area. And um, I mean, I've, I've devoted the past 16 years working for San Juan Citizens Alliance um, often very isolated, often very, you know, being told, you know, uh, that transition will never happen. And here we are on the cusp of it. So for us, um, the avant -garde stipulations are important. And we just decided because we're not rate payers of PNM, it was a better deal for us to sort of be in the mix and kind of being like, hey, avant -garde, here's the things that you, you know, you're going to need to do if you do take over. Um, if it defaults back to PNM um, and the merger doesn't go through, we need to be prepared for that too. So a lot of our stuff is sort of crystal ballish, um, but we'll be ready. And uh, another thing I appreciate is us all sort of thinking on our feet because there's a lot of moving parts. Um, I truly love like the interdisciplinary nature of this stuff. You can't just be a lawyer, you know, you could be a biologist, you could be an endangered species expert, you could be a National Environmental Policy Act expert. I mean, um, you could be an economist. I mean, we've had a lot of help from a lot of people. And so anyway, we'll, we'll keep it going. Mike, thanks so much. Um, I, I've been very fortunate and to been in meetings with you over many years and it's been a treat. Um, you've thrown out a tremendous amount of stuff um, in the last uh, half hour or so. And I, before we go on, uh, I'd like to give uh, Joseph and Nicole um, a chance to jump back in uh, to uh, comment on some of the stuff um, that you said, if, if, if that would be good. And Jim, let me also note that uh, <clears throat> um, we got a fact sheet from Robin that was posted in the chat. It's one of them is very good. It's a, it's a nice one pager summary compilation of kind of all of the benefits that uh, as they've been discussing all of the community benefits, the millions of dollars that go towards, you know, redevelopment and community investments and all of those things, in addition to accelerating the uh, transition to renewable energy by five years. So that's worth looking at as well. Good. Yeah, and we'll we'll also uh, reproduce that on our on our website. Thank you, thank you, Robin, for that. Uh, Nicole, this, uh, Joseph, this is what that looks like. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'll let Nicole go first. If she has anything more to add on. 
I don't, I don't think I have anything else to add on unless somebody has questions, in which case I could wait till later for questions. Nicole, the, the one thing you talked about uh, briefly, uh, I think you bring a perspective because my understanding is um, that you're on the Arizona uh, side of the border uh, and work there. And so um, that adds a little complexity where you have uh, the Navajo Nation, we have two different states, we have, I don't know, half a dozen different utilities. Um, what, what does the Arizona side bring uh, to this conversation? What, what do you do over there that will help us understand the impacts there? Well, I think, I think that what we've gone through on the Arizona side, parts of it, <clears throat> the New Mexico side has already gone through, like, um, you know, like Mike was saying that we go to these meetings where we're talking about coal plant closure and we're facing mine workers and plant workers on the Arizona side. Um, you know, I, I just got done going to uh, an, an Arizona Corporation Commission meeting that was hosted actually there in Farmington. And uh, I did, I was in a room where there was a lot of plant workers and mine workers and they were in, most of them were not, not native. So that was, that was quite a change for, from what I'm used to on the Arizona side, the only coal is in within the Navajo Nation and the power plant sits outside the Navajo Nation. But most of those workers that were there were Dine Navajo workers, whether they were mine workers or plant workers. So closing a coal plant and closing a coal mine in Arizona was extremely difficult. It was very political. Um, we were up against our own people. We were up against our own government. And we had a lot of outside, you know, like utility representatives. And at one point, even the governor of the state of Arizona and representatives all pushing to keep the plant open where the out environmental impacts to both Black Mesa and the area around the NGS plant were just tremendous. And it's, it's all the, 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 the complexity of how the Arizona plants were agreed upon, everyone that was involved brought in a lot of different entities you know because the energy was built for the central arizona project which is this, this huge canal that diverts water from the colorado river into central and southern arizona so the beneficiaries of both the water and the power was like the whole southern arizona not only that but the owners were in nevada and los angeles so we had dealt with utilities from with outside the state so what i'm trying to say is that it was very complex it was extremely difficult to maneuver through that whole thing it made us realize a lot of things that then it made us realize i think a lot of things about what it meant to be Diné and living on the on the nation where your resources are being exploited by industry, by utilities that are that that that's not within the nation. They're either uh, Arizona or New Mexico, um, or they might be from somewhere else. You know, like we we had California, and Nevada to deal with, but that it made us really look at the resources that we were gonna be left with and how we were going to move forward without those resources and what we had to do if we wanted to move forward with those resources, namely water. And so whether it's in New Mexico and Arizona, the Diné people are facing essentially the same thing, the exploitation of resources 
for outside entities, ratepayers that we don't even know, and the you know incre the the diminishing water sources, and, and that and it's extremely rapid that that our water is declining, and we, we just had to do something now. So we're using, taking our experiences with both the Corporation Commission, experiences with the utility, because see, we're dealing with APS in Arizona. Right now we're dealing with APS. This is what these recent Corporation Commission meetings were all about. And who, who's the majority owner and operator of Four Corners, which sits right there in New Mexico? It's APS again. So, it's it's funny because we're we early on we were seeing mess one type of messaging in Arizona and then a different type of messaging on the Navajo Nation and then like a little bit different type of messaging from the same utility in New Mexico. So we're trying to pull all that back together and we're trying to make trying to make sure that the direction the Navajo Nation goes is intentional and it is towards renewable energy and that the priority is on the water. And we definitely wanna make sure that our Navajo communities get some kind of transitional support directly from the utilities. And we know that there's ETA funds out there, but we're just not seeing Navajo communities getting a whole lot from that. There's, there's gotta be some kind of prioritization of Navajo communities having given up so much, having, having had to forego uh, just basic infrastructure development because so much of the water was committed to industry and so much of the land and you know, we're in a place where our own utilities are not regulated. We're in a we're in a place where there's no way to file grievance within the Navajo Nation. Should you know, you know, and hence all the pollution in within our boundaries, and the, the the way that reclamation is happening now on Black Mesa with the now closed coal mines. We're fighting hard to make sure the reclamation happens. So this is the difference between fighting for Diné communities and fighting for non-Indigenous communities in the same state, just divided by the tribal boundaries. So nothing's different the way I see it, fighting on the Arizona side of the Navajo Nation, fighting on the New Mexico side of the Navajo Nation, we have one resource committee chairperson and he has no problem moving back and forth between Arizona and New Mexico. He makes these decisions for Navajo communities, whether it's in Arizona or New Mexico. And he's from right there in New Mexico. He's from um, um, Rick Nez, Mike. Um, he's Nina Hanzad, right, in that area. And so there, there should be, we, we want to just make sure we help the Diné communities that are, and groups like San Juan Citizen Alliance, um, to make sure that uh, transition happens and it's with intent and the Navajo communities don't get left out. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. That's a very eloquent statement. Um, helps me understand a, a whole nother dimension of what's going on. Um, Joseph? Thank you. And, and yes, you know, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, this is not easy, you know, it's not an easy, easy uh, uh, um, thing to, to, to make a, a sound, decision but the the reality is up here in northwest new mexico where we are dependent on fossil fuel everybody um i know everybody 
um, around me knows somebody that works in the fossil fuel industry. When I first graduated high school, the first job I got was at San Juan Jardine Station. When I moved back from uh, 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 living off the reservation um, after eight years, the first job I got was working at Four Corners Power Plant. Um, there's a, a um, we're, we're in, in an, an apparent moment right now to be able to, um, to, to shift that dependency to these projects that are already in the pipeline. You know, there's um, the, the BLM project that just got permitted uh, that, you know, that will definitely uh, help uh, the, the economy over here. Uh, then you have the uh, Navajo Nation, which received money from the state for another utility scale solar project uh, just south of, of, of Farmington, um, you know, and, and again, Navajo Tech, man, it, it, it's, that's like an, an, a, a true opportunity to have a Navajo workforce, you know, uh, to train a Navajo workforce, because they have a, a facility, uh, a, a, a satellite school in Kirtland, which is just in between Shiprock and Farmington. Uh, I, I, I live in Shiprock and Shiprock is the largest Navajo community in the, in, in, in the Navajo nation. And so, um, you know, there's definitely um, the, the, the stuff that's in the stipulation agreement that, that were provisions that we uh, advocated for are, are, are gonna uh, have a positive impact on, on the, uh, you know, for, for us, you know, it, it's going to benefit uh, the Navajo communities up here. And, and it's something that uh, leadership, Navajo leadership recognized that, but uh, I keep, keep in mind, um, Navajo leadership is going through a transition right now. There's an election that's happening and, and there's over, um, right now there's over 15 candidates that are running for Navajo, uh, for Navajo Nation presidency, uh, that they're going to have a primary August 2nd. And so, uh, you know, there, there's just a, a lot that, that's happening right now with Navajo Nation leadership. And so, um, yeah, and, and we're hoping that we could get, um, you know, these issues uh, a part of the conversation when, when, when the voters are, are, are asking these, these questions. So, I, yeah, I, I just want to mention how important uh, this, uh, you know, um, th this is for, for the, especially for the Navajo communities, because like, I, I still got um, relatives right now in my community that don't have access to electricity, that don't have access to running water, you know, and, and we, you know, and, and this is, uh, you know, part of the agreement is definitely jobs that what, what we're going to secure, clean jobs, clean energy jobs. The other part of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, is uh, I think uh, 2.5 million for five years, um, you know, and, and that's going to be in our control, uh, not, not the Navajo Nation, because uh, that, that was something that we were, we were careful with to make sure that it doesn't go to Winter Rock, that the central a, a government doesn't make a decision on where it goes to that that money is in our control so thank you uh, thank you joseph um you know that reminds me of something you said of an incredible uh fact uh, i'm i'm worked in the electrical industry my whole life and so i tune in kind of this stuff but the fact that the huge number of uh, navajo families uh, don't have uh, electricity and they and a lot of them have the these giant power lines going right over their hogans and they don't have electricity right so um in the united states there are a lot of people that don't have electricity in their homes 80 percent of those families live on the navajo nation of, of all the families in the entire country that don't have electricity 80 percent 
um, eight out of 10 live on the Navajo Nation. And that's just an example of the asymmetry uh, of the benefit from this extractive industry. Um, New Mexico would not be the same state if it didn't have uh, the electricity uh, and the other resources from Four Corners, uh, but the people there are uh, not benefiting in the same way. So this is, it's an, it's an old story uh, and it's so exciting to hear, uh, hear the stories from, from the perspective of people actually living on the ground there because so much of this dialogue has been driven by people living in Albuquerque and Santa Fe and we haven't heard all the dimensions of these stories. So, um, Mike, what, what, what are we missing? What have we left out? I think We've it's cool. I, I, I think it's, uh, I think there's some great comments in, uh, in the, um, in the chat. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, um, one of the things that I'm sort of proud of is that, um, that <clears throat> the organizations from the four corners who are on the phone tonight that, that, you know, I think that we are respected in the community as having sort of legitimate um, concerns and, and, and legitimate stakeholders. And so I don't want people to think that, you know, it's all adversarial with us and like the coal workers and people who work at the coal plants because they're our neighbors, you know, and, and um, it's, it's just, an, it's interesting sort of the way it's being portrayed by the corporations. And I'm, I'm also fascinated by this like ESG stuff because I think that, you know, Avangrid and Iberdrola probably have done some pretty crappy things. And I also think that PNM has been, you know, PNM, their, their thing up here was sort of like the philanthrop philanthropic arm, you know, throwing a little bit of money around and kind of going, you know, like we're, we're doing all this for the community, but, you know, what have they really done um, in terms of sort of the long-term transition vision? And so, you know, you look at their rhetoric and you look at their actions and I think we're doing our best to hold them accountable in terms of kind of going, hey, whether it's Avangrid or, or, or PNM, at some point, you know, it's their actions, not, you know, their rhetoric. And you know, the PNM, the PNM thing, I think they're just trying to extricate themselves with their golden parachute stuff, which is kind of a kind of appalling. Um, but that's the reality is that big utilities are big utilities. And again, um, so the stuff that um, Nicole and Robin and Joseph, like we're, we're often given testimony against like Arizona Public Service Company, Tucson Electric Power, where, you know, their executives are trying to portray all these great things they've done. And we're trying to, we're trying to get like in Arizona, $100, $100 million transition funding was agreed to by APS but the Arizona Corporate Commission doesn't want to set a precedent. And now they just want to give like $10 million um, in New Mexico. Um, some of us are on the Energy Transition Act implementation. Some of us are, you know, on phone calls with these $600 an hour lawyers from Washington, D.C., trying to broker deals with Avangrid. And we're pushing back on them saying, unless you come for your site visit, unless you, you know, beef up your stipulations, we're going to drop out. I mean, we could always do that. We could always bag them. Um, and they know that. So um, I think that things are still um, kind of in, in motion. It's volatile. Um, the world's a crazy place, but um, we could, we could end up if the, if the renewable energy projects get past this uh, this supply chain bump and, and start being built, um, I think that um, we have been pretty successful. And then again, um, let's make sure that San Juan Generation Station retires in September. Um, let's clean this slate with that um, polluting facility, be done with it. Um, that is another thing that I think that our groups have decided that, you know, we wanted to go after the largest polluting um, sources in Northwest New Mexico. And there's no doubt that those coal plants have, you know, 
provided um, jobs and, and, and electricity, but um, a lot of heartache up here too in terms of the pollution, in terms of the economic duress, and in terms of um, the failure to assign liabilities and the abandonment. Thank you, Mike. Sure. Uh, uh, Tom Solomon, uh, my co-coordinator, uh, has been monitoring the chat. Uh, Tom is, um, I'd, I'd like to give some other people who've been with us uh, for the last hour and a half an opportunity to, uh, to weigh in, uh, ask some questions or clarifications. Can you, uh, is there something there that jumps out or so other people can just- um, you, you want me to open the chat? Yeah, that'd be great. So I think, and uh, maybe we can ask Sydney Beatles to uh, unmute and potentially ask, answer some of these things because they have to do, uh, some of the questions have to do with, you know, uh, Avangrid, Iberdrola as a foreign company and whether they can really be held to account and required to, for example, follow through with uh, um, the, the requirements of the stipulation, assuming that the merger went through and all the stipulations um, became contractual obligations. And there is, you know, skepticism about whether in fact a Spanish company could be required to follow New Mexico law and adhere to these stipulations. And that might be something Sydney could speak to if you're willing and you feel confident. You want to tr make a stab at that, Sydney? Um, I can read the specific comment if you like. Well, so if Avangrid and Avangrid's parent company is Iberdrola from Spain, if they acquire PNM, the company and PNM's assets that are located in New Mexico and can't be moved out of New Mexico, right? These are like electrical facilities and power plants. Um, it won't be the first foreign company to own a utility in New Mexico. Um, there's at least one regulated water utility that's owned by a Canadian company, New Mexico Gas Company um, is owned by a Canadian parent company and, um, and as you know, El Paso Electric is owned by a bank, JP Morgan. So the fact that <clears throat> these parent corporations are located out of state um, does not, it does not weaken the regulatory control over the rates and service in assets located in New Mexico. Um, does it complicate it? Yes, and one of the things that when I was on staff at the commission we had to watch out for is to make sure that they aren't investing their earnings that they make from New Mexico customers in other states markets to a degree that's not reasonable. You don't want them to take all the money they make here and then invest them in other like states, right? That, um, that happened with um, Quest, which is CenturyLink's predecessor. But th is that an issue that regulators know to look out for? Yes. And is that an issue that regulators have adequate controls? Yes. There are restrictions on the amounts that PNM can dividend up to its parent corporation already, and those aren't going to change. So um, and also, as you know, Avon Grid has a renewable development company that competes with companies like Pattern and Nextera to develop wind turbines in south and in, in east central New Mexico, uh, mostly, um, and for um, export to other states in the wholesale market. Um, so the PRC has lots of controls over affiliate transactions to make sure that utility personnel and operations aren't used to support competitive services. Those rules and regs have been in place for decades. And, um, and you know, there may be some advantages to Avangrid having a renewable development 
affiliate located in New Mexico because they may want like a super dependable, renewable oriented public utility, you know, PNM in order to, you know, to support not financially, but just in terms of like the system as a whole to support um, the, to facilitate transmission of renewable energy from one part of the state to the other. And we do need more transmission capacity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and decarbonize. I'll stop there. If anyone has more specific questions, um, I'm happy to give it a go. Thank you, uh, Sydney. There's one more, oh, I think we have a, a few questions in the chat. I'm gonna go to one of the earlier ones from Walter. I'll just read it. Um, why can't the Navajo Nation develop its own renewables? Why can't Farmington do the same? Do we need a Spanish company to do it for us? I worry that Avangrid will suck all of the financial benefits out of New Mexico. Somebody want to make a stab at that? I think that's a general concern that's been expressed well, by. I mean, Navajo, Navajo Nation and Navajo Tribal Utility Authority, they have their own like service areas, right? Like they can't they can't sell electricity to PNM because these are still um, you know regulated monopoly utility companies and that's a matter of state law and if that market model is going to change it needs to be taken up with the legislature and if you force utilities to open up their service area to competition then they need to be compensated for taking their you know taking their property it can be done. I mean, you know, New Mexico almost deregulated its uh, generation, electric generation in the early 2000s. But when there was so much market manipulation in California, we, we repealed that. So, I mean, so yes, I mean, they can, there can be solar um, facilities, solar projects that are developed in Farmington or on the Navajo Nation. But it just depends on who they can sell that power to. They can develop it for their own use. Uh, Joseph, uh, do you have, you, you've been talking about that kind of area. Do you have something to add to that? Yes. Uh, um, uh, let me just say that we're, we're trying to get the, uh, and maybe Nicole, you can hop in on, on this as well. The Navajo Nation energy policy has not been updated since 2015. And we want to ensure that there's language in that Navajo Nation policy that includes um, citing re renewable energy projects because uh, what's happening is the utility company, NTUA, is like they're building these utility scale solar projects uh, without a, you know, through a community consent, you know, like uh, they're, they're getting consent from the leadership, local leadership. But when it comes to the community uh, level, uh, there's not that um, you know full con consent from from the community on those projects. The other the other piece of that is that um, um, we don't have net metering over here, you know, uh, as far as like the, the the community, you know, like like you know these when we talk about grid tied. <laughs> You know, we, we got we to gotta get something like that going over here. Even President Nez told me himself that, uh, you know, we need NTUA to implement net metering program. The president wants net metering, but it's just a utility company. L uh, for example, when the CARES Act money came through, we got money to connect uh, homes that never had electricity onto the grid, uh, onto a microgrid, off off grid, uh, uh, you know, system, but yet the the contractor, which was uh, well, which was NTUA, picked it up. They're charging the customers eighty four dollars a month for operation and maintenance, you know, for from money that was received from the CARES Act federal money. So they're they're you know, it just shows you the this cycle of uh you know like i guess uh what what i i call uh uh colonialism <laughs> you know like they're just you know they 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 you know they're really uh it, it's really gonna take a lot to 
to to get a um, lo lot of this stuff into like um, the, the the, the, the other aspect of this is that we, we don't have energy experts on the Navajo Nation. Whenever, like, a lot of these companies don't know who to, who to start with. You know, there's no roadmap on these energy projects. Do, do I talk to the president's office? Do I talk to the Navajo Nation Council? Do I go to the land department? You know, there's no, you know, direction on, on where to start. And so what, um, what, uh, what a lot of people are asking for, both you know, the president's office and, and, and as well as council delegates is, is cr creation of an energy office, you know? And so we, 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 we gotta get like, um, e even Navajo Nation council delegate, um, uh, Amber Crotty had even mentioned, you know, we can't let council delegates uh, make those, uh, decisions we, we got to get like third party experts people who, who who are experts in this field to to uh look through these proposals and and not you know like uh because you're having the the, the council delegates who who are not making those informed decisions you know so thank you thank you joseph uh very much uh, so we're getting near the end of our evening, um, and I don't know uh, if there, there's um, someone whose voice needs to be heard. Uh, you can. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Um, how, why don't we uh, let Gary Coffin uh, ask uh, ask his question? Go ahead, Thank Gary. You. Thank you, Tom. Um, I, I guess my my question really comes down to. I guess two main topics, and I'll make this as quick as possible. Um, one really has to do with Avangrid and Ibadrola's exploitative practices um, elsewhere, um, and they have a long history. Uh, Indivisible, I'm vice president of Indivisible Albuquerque, and we just got through penning. Um, I'm sure some of you have read it, uh, uh, an amicus brief um, supporting the PRC's decision. Um, one of the things that we focus on is, is those exploitative practices. Um, practices that are can still ongoing despite um, um, allegations made in the record that they've made corrective, taken corrective actions to improve consumer um, relations and and other issues. Um, a four hundred and sixty six million dollar fine in Mexico for um, just this inter affiliate stuff. They were making shell companies um, in Mexico. Did it for twenty five years. Were able to. Um, get around the regulators in Mexico and sell energy into unpermitted markets um, to which they got hit with a major fine. Um, and then on top of that, <clears throat> what I think another thing that really controls me is PNM's um, insist or excuse me, Ibadrola's insistence on maintaining control of PNM's board of directors. And I'm just kind of wondering how uh, I understand the need to um, get a renewable transition. And I respect it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll support anything that, that you all do to push for that. And I, and I believe in it wholeheartedly. Um, we need this transition. But p and worth $8 million, uh, or excuse me, $8 billion in assets is kind of what they report. Um, Avangrid is worth $38 billion right now. Ibadrol is worth $160 billion, I believe. Um, I'm just concerned that if we're having trouble keeping P&M in check, what is life going to look like? under both Ibadrola and Avangrid's um, exploitation of our natural resources. Who wants to, who wants to handle that hot potato? I, I, I would just say that, um, thank you so much for doing an amicus and yeah. you know, like weighing in, because I mean, <clears throat> I guess that, you know, it's just really important for us to be aware of the information that's out there. And I think that sometimes we sort of get kind of focused on the things that are going on kind of in our community and go, you know, all right, what are the things that um, the bigger picture? And so um, I think your points are well taken and um, definitely a consideration. Some of this stuff is definitely in flux. Um, I'm not sure that, like I said before, I'm not sure anybody thought that, you know, the merger was gonna be um, where the merger situation is where it is now. So we'll definitely take that on, you know, under advice. So appreciate that. 
Um, I would like to respond to a piece of it, Jim. Oh, good. And um, yeah, I spent over 20 years with the PRC and the last three years I've been with Western Resource Advocates. And uh, when I first started hearing after the merger was announced about uh, issues regarding Avon Grid owned utilities compliance in New York, Connecticut, and Maine, I did a lot of research. And I've talked to uh, previous Maine commissioners, current Connecticut commissioners who I ran into at a conference. Um, I've also read the orders issued by those respective states utility commissions. And I will say that I have found that there are, you know, there's more than one side to every issue and there's a lot of complexity there. And um, I also just wanted to point out that, that um, Avon Grid did ultimately agree to uh, a majority of independent board members in New Mexico, because that was a condition that Ashley Schnauer, the hearing examiner, recommended to the commission if they decided to approve the stipulation. And there is a filing signed by Avon Grid where they have they agreed to accept that. So, but not but but the CEO of Ibadrola would maintain control would be the chief, right? No. Would be the head of the board of directors. Is that not that's not incorrect? Well, you know, I want to know what you're referring to because uh, we can maybe I should reach out to you separately later no, because okay. Conservation Voters New Mexico also specifically asked me about that issue. I went back to the filings. I did not see that, but maybe you're referring to something I missed. Okay. Okay. Gary, you want to put your uh, email in the chat so it's Yeah, I would love to. And then the only other thing that I would add is that, you know, they formed a political action committee when in Maine when the referendum and the voters tried to oppose them. They, the Ibadrola and its parent, excuse me, Avangrid and its friendly companies spent $70 million on that pack. Um, and do you, know, do you know how much their competitor Nextera spent on that issue too? No, I do not. Like a very comparable amount of money. <laughs> so, right. because oh, Nextera oh, yeah. doesn't want that transmission line. And I'm not saying that transmission line should have been laid in that beautiful, pristine woods and forest, right? But Nextera didn't want that line to bring hydro from Canada down to Nextera's service area in Western Mass. Right. But the reality is, is we've never had a political action committee in New Mexico spend $70 million. And the no. fact that this company could be able to do that, imagine what opposing a company that could spend that sort of money would look like in New Mexico. And that's why Indivisible is concerned about, about this. And that's why we need good regulators in New Mexico too. <laughs> oh, yeah, so uh, th th I mean, this obviously, um, this is a fascinating discussion and uh, we could go on for another couple of hours. Um, I'm gonna take the, Put my contact in the chat. The, the, the moderator's prerogative. You know, uh, I've been working in the environmental uh, regulatory and PRC venues uh, for quite a long time. I, I was in the private sector doing it. Uh, I had a renewable company. Uh, when we started out, um, p and was wagging the dog. The tail was wagging the dog. And we have come so far in this state in terms of uh, meaningful utility regulation. Um, and, you know, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And, and some people's answer to that challenge is to change the whole model and, uh, you know, nationalize or, or buy out the utilities. And that's a whole nother discussion. Uh, but, um, I think we tonight we have got a little peek uh, at the enormous complexity, uh, both for the people on the ground in the Four Corners area, and for the larger state uh, on these issues. And and I think I have learned that there, there aren't uh, simple answers to any of this. And I think Mike has has been very very good. You know, we we've got our foot in the door. Uh, as a state with the Energy Transition Act, we've got our foot in the door to a meaningful transition to 100% renewable energy. And that's a huge effort and a huge challenge uh, at all these levels. And, and I don't think we should forget the 
technological cha challenge it is for the utilities themselves. This is not easy stuff all across the border. And I'm, I'm so excited that we're all involved here. And uh, um, thank you all very much. And thank you, Tom, for, uh, for nailing down, uh, holding down the chat. And uh, let's continue this conversation going forward. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks. Good night. All right. So if anybody wants to save the chat, um, if you go into the chat box, there's those three little dots in the upper right corner. Click that and sit, click save chat. I'll give you to the uh, count of five to do that. And then we will adjourn for the evening. Four, three, two, one. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night.